In this video, I'm going to go ahead and get you set up with an app on your phone for free that's going to unlock all the manual settings, all the big settings you'd have available on a mirrorless or cinema camera, but on your phone. Blackmagic have come along and completely destroyed the existing competition and basically offered the ultimate free camera app for everyone. This is an amazing place to start and we're going to go through it, get it set up, walk you through all the settings, explain how manual settings work, and basically just get you completely ready to go and shooting on a camera as if you are a professional filmmaker. If you haven't already, jump onto your app store and download the Blackmagic Camera app. If you need help, the links are in the description as always. Once you've got through the process of starting up and opening the app, you're going to end up on their filming screen which has all your settings that you would ever want on a camera app. Let's walk through them and get set up. On the left hand side at the top we have your lens choice. This is going to enable you to go through all your lenses, whether you want that ultra wide to squeeze lots into your image or whether you want to go much tighter with the 77 millimeter. I've done a whole video on which lens is best so if you want to go in depth on that watch the video. We also have our front facing cameras but for now we'll just stay in that 1x so that we can demonstrate the camera and all the settings. Over on your FPS, your frames per second, you can choose how many frames are taken, how many images are taken and squeezed into your video every single second. In 4K on most phones you're going to be able to go up to 60 FPS here. When it comes to choosing your frame rate you generally want to fall in line with what most professional filmers are going to set up so that if you come across any other cameras and mix the footage up it's going to be a similar frame rate. In my case, because I'm in the UK, we have 50 hertz electricity, so we want to look at the PAL format, which is going to be multiples of 25 FPS. So both 50 and 25 will be great options. If you Google your country's electricity rate and it is 60 hertz, then you want to be shooting on NTSC, which enables you to do these frame rates. The simple reason for this is that it stops lights from flickering in your video due to the electrical refresh rate differing from the refresh rate of your camera. Usually if you were shooting on a mirrorless camera or if you have an ND filter I would recommend shooting at the lower base rate camera setting of 25 in my case or 24 if you're on NTSC but because we're on mobile and I don't have an ND filter we're actually going to pump this up to 50. The reason for this is that if you want slow-mo then you need to play back your frame rate slower than it is being filmed at so you need more frames and then if you're shooting in brighter scenes and don't don't have an ND filter which we'll cover in a moment then your shutter speed will end up being closer to what gives you nice motion blur. You can select your shutter speed by moving over to shutter. Currently this says 180 degrees but if we go into our settings we are able to change this. Select camera and then scroll down to shutter speed. Depending on what you want, you can choose speed or angle. We want it to be 180 degrees, which is double our frame rate. So as you can see, our shutter speed now says 1 over 100 rather than 180 degrees. To get the perfect motion blur that's like what we see with our eyes, we want our shutter speed to be double or 180 degrees to our frames per second. So at 50 FPS, we want 1 over 100. At 25 FPS, we would want 1 over 50. At 100 FPS, we would want 1 over 200, effectively doubling the fraction of our FPS. We covered how to operate your shutter speed, but what actually is shutter speed? Your shutter speed is how long each of the photos is taken that is equivalent to each of the frames in your video. So at 50 FPS, 50 times a second, your phone is taking a photo and our shutter speed is how long that photo is taken for. So for example, we're currently at 1 over 100, which is 100th of a second. We can exaggerate this by going much higher, which is going to be 1 over 8,000. That means that our photos for each frame are only been taken for an 8,000th of a second. This is what would give you a very choppy image. And also you can see it's made our image much, much darker because we're taking in light for a very short period of time. Coming down to a much lower shutter speed is made our image much brighter and actually overexpose our image. So whilst you can control your exposure with your shutter speed, we don't really want to do that. We want to stick to our 180 degrees or double our FPS and that's going to give us the most natural professional look. However, if you're forced to, you may have to adjust this to get your exposure 
exposure right. Next up we have our aperture, but this is greyed out because you tend to not be able to adjust this on mobile phone cameras. It requires moving parts so they just can't fit into such a small lens and sensor layout. Our aperture is how open our lens is. The more open it is, the more light it lets in, the more closed it is, the less light it lets in. These tend to be fixed at very low apertures because we have tiny sensors that need more light hit them in order to get a good image. Because we can't adjust aperture on phones, I'm going to move on to ISO and not cover it in too much depth. Our ISO is the sensitivity of our sensor, the light that it receives, how sensitive it is to that. So for example, as the lens is receiving the light for the hundredth of a second that our shutter is open, how sensitive is it to that light? By moving this up to a higher number, we make it more sensitive, down to a lower number makes it less sensitive. But there's a couple of issues we have to cover. One is that if our shutter is fixed and we get very bright, then we cannot make our image any darker with the settings available on our camera. The second is that if our image is very dark and we move our ISO up to get exposed nicely, we're going to end up with a very grainy image. This is because it's effectively boosting the information coming into the sensor, which can result in errors so you get that grainy image. So whilst we can control the light hitting our sensor with our ISO, you tend to want to keep it low and you tend to not want to be messing with it too much. Because your aperture is fixed and can't be adjusted to adjust the light coming into your camera, your shutter speed isn't really something you want to mess with if you're really chasing the manual setup. And then your ISO is kind of limited on a phone for how high you can push it and then obviously it can't go below a certain level. There's only one additional thing we can do to fix the light coming into our sensor and that's to block it before it comes in. If I turn these lights around you'll see they are completely overexposed, they're white, which really isn't ideal if we wanted to show the LEDs inside this. However, we can use something called an ND filter. You can get cases specifically for your phone that have these built in, but for the sake of this little mini example I'm going to use one that I can move around in front of the phone. You can see that when I put this in front of the phone it is blocking light coming into the sensor so it's much darker. I'm going to move this back now so it covers the whole lens. You can see a little bit of reflection in here and that's just because this isn't close enough and it's not designed for the phone. But a proper case with a proper ND filter for your phone would fix this. You can now see that as I adjust my ND filter, we're going to adjust the amount of light coming through it, which is going to enable me to control what hits my sensor before all these settings come into play, which is really useful. The only downside to this is that you're starting to hit the limits of what a small phone sensor can do in terms of dynamic range, which is the difference between how bright detail it can film and how dark detail it can film without either completely crushing it to black or whiting it out to overexposed. So you can see in this, because we've exposed the LED lights, we can no longer see the drone. All of those things are going to allow you to control your exposure, lock it into what best exposes your environment, and then film without it shifting. The shifting of exposure is what makes your filming look amateur. When it's locked in and controlled, you get a much nicer image and you don't get that shifting. On the note of shifting, there's something else that shifts, which we're moving on to now. Our white balance. Your camera doesn't actually know what color of light it's seeing, it has to guess and when you're on auto white balance it guesses constantly. So it's often not quite perfect and also shifting all the time. Like I mentioned earlier with the exposure, it's that shifting that makes it look like amateur footage versus professional footage where all your settings are locked in and it doesn't shift around as you're filming. In this case we've got a few cool things going on. First is that we can let the camera do auto and then lock it so it's going to just choose the settings that it thinks are right and then you lock it so it doesn't shift but we can also then turn off auto go straight to manual and control how we want the color of light to look with 10,000k being the top limit very warm and the bottom limit being 2,500k or sometimes down to 1,000k which treats the light in our image to be much bluer you can see this has gone too blue and it is not how our image look if you're really keen you will know these numbers off by heart depending on what lights you're working on or if you're not colorblind like myself you can look at your image and get it to a point where you're happy with it. However there's some presets over on the side that are useful so when it's sunny you can just click on sun. When you have filament bulbs you can select filament which is going to bring it down to what most of those come out as. When you've got the big strip lights in warehouses and things it tends to come out about 400k and then you have shade and cloud which have their own respective k values that are pretty consistent and then move my light out of the way so we get 
back to our usual image and you can see that we're coming out at about 3800 Kelvin. I'm going to lock it so it doesn't shift around. We then have our tint. So where white balance was how warm and red our image looked or how cool and blue our image looked, tint is the greens and the pinks. So unlocking this and then scrolling lower is going to make our image much greener and then scrolling up is going to make our image look much more pink. Again, I'm just going to switch over to auto, let it choose where it wants to be and then I'm going to lock it. We've now covered all our film settings, so this is completely locked. As we move around, as we change how our image looks, it's not going to change the camera settings at all. This is great because it looks so much better when you cut this all together and it's not doing the shifting. Let's get a different camera view just for a bit of fun because that's going to help us in a minute. You can see our focus is off. We will fix that soon. Over on the right, we then have the ability to choose some overlays. The first is going to be zebras. Zebras are really useful and I like having these on. What they do is provide an overlay for your image when it is above a certain exposure. So to know whether something's completely white out, you set it to 100%. So when I show this light, you can see it's covered in zebras. And then you can actually bring it lower. I like to have it at the lower setting, which is 75. And the reason for this is the most important thing always when you shoot is your skin tones. You want these to be around 75 to 80%. Just to make the image a bit clearer, I'm going to pop it up to 80. But what this means is that when you're filming someone, if they've got zebras on their skin, you need to bring the ISO or turn your ND filter up a little bit just to block a little bit light and get their skin nicely exposed. On that note, we'll jump back to our white balance if you've got someone in your shot, it's their skin that matters most. So focus on the light source that's hitting their skin, not the overall light source that you have on your scene. Back over to our overlays, we can then move on to focus. Focus peaking is really useful. It lets you see what's in focus. I'm just gonna move this back slightly because we were actually beyond our minimum focus. There's like a distance that your camera just cannot focus at and you sometimes have to move back from your subject if you're within the range, it can't focus. Peaking settings effectively highlight what is in focus in red so you know if you're nailing your focus or not. In this case I've got it set to 100% so I know what is the most sharp part of my image but you don't want to bring this down too low or you might think that you have something in focus when it's not. Then we have our grid overlays. I don't like using the bottom two. They are effectively for centering your image but I am a big fan of rule of thirds. This just enables us to position things well in our camera as we're filming because we can just line stuff up with the points at which they overlay. So if you have a subject, perhaps you want their face on the top right corner or the top left corner, it just helps you guide how you're framing your subject and keeping them in the same place in your frame as you pan around them. Next, we have another form of overlay, which is effectively, if you know that you're gonna be outputting in a certain format, then you can turn this on and you can choose what you want to be shooting in. So if you're shooting content that you want to be both vertical and landscape, then you can set up a vertical overlay on this, keep everything within that. And then when you're shooting wide, you have the extra bits that are currently grayed out. When you're shooting vertical, you can cut those off and you have your vertical image. This is what I like to do. But if you were shooting specifically for a really wide aspect ratio, you can put on 2.4 to 1, which is going to squish the top and let you know what will still be in your frame once you cut off the top and the bottom. Kind of a fake way of doing anamorphic cinematic lenses. For the sake of this video, I'm just going to turn that off so there's not too many things going on on the screen. Then we have our safety margins. These are really good if you just want to make sure that you don't accidentally lose framing on your subject. So if we put this down to about 80%, you just make sure that everything you want in frame is inside this box. And then if you accidentally go outside, it's fine because they're still in frame. Again, it's just a little guide to help you film. But as you can see, we've stacked quite a lot of graphics on top of our image. And there is a point where there's just too much information going on, but it's really your own personal preference. Again, for the sake of keeping it somewhat clear, I'm going to turn that off, but I would normally have that on. We then have another overlay, which I don't use so much, which just puts some color on your screen depending on how bright your image is. So you can see that as I move this light, the stuff that goes red is very, very bright. 
there you go and the stuff that's dark so our sound panels at the back here go very very blue and that's just again another tool to help you make sure everything is exposed how you want but as I mentioned I don't tend to use this coming down we can then put LUTs on top of our image I'm not going to cover these but if you are going for a specific look you can just see how the LUT looks as you film versus finding out later but I personally wouldn't do this I would film without the LUTs and then you have maximum control in DaVinci Resolve later on next we have our focus on a phone I would generally leave this in auto but if you do want to lock it perhaps if you've got something that's a bit awkward for the auto to latch onto or it's just misbehaving then you can use your focus peaking to see what is in focus and what is out of focus and set it exactly how you want. We then have your metering so this is when you are using those automatic settings you have your baseline of zero which is what it thinks it should be exposed to but perhaps if you've got a scene that's again being a bit tricky maybe you've got some windows or some source of lighting that you don't want it to take into account then you can choose actually i'd like you to automatically set those settings a bit brighter or i'd like you to automatically set those settings a bit lower so you can see when we have the metering selected, it's just automatically changing all the settings to hit the look that we have asked it to do. I'm going to leave that on zero. And again, I don't tend to use this because it's again playing into those auto settings, which you could just be filming on your normal camera app. Moving on, we then have how much digital processing is going to happen to stabilize our image. I've actually been very impressed with the testing I've done so far with this on Extreme. It doesn't seem to warp the image too much, but as you can see, it's hardly cropping in and leaving it on Extreme just means that you know you're going to have relatively stable footage. Like most of these settings it's personal preference but that's just what I've decided to do. At the bottom we then have our zoom for the lens that we're on so it starts at 3x because this is a 3x 77 millimeter lens but you can zoom in more. This is a digital zoom however which I don't recommend. Digital zooming is where it's just cropping in digitally it's effectively zooming in on the image you've already got and it's much more useful to be able to do this in post where you have more control you're kind of just locking off your options by zooming in on digitally so i don't use zoom and i don't recommend you use it then at the bottom we have some settings that you're probably not going to mess with unless you start getting a bit keen but this allows you to name your clip it allows you to select whether it's a good clip or a bad clip um, along with a few other things it's effectively adding some metadata to your video so that when you go through in the editing software you can see ah that was the good take that was the bad take this is the one I want to use very quickly versus having to watch them all through and work it out again later when you can just name what it is here and now at the bottom left you can see that we have a histogram I actually would prefer it if DaVinci Resolve could throw in a few different graphs here I much prefer waveforms for seeing what's going on but it's effectively your video shown in a different format so all the lines on your waveform line up with what's going on in your image. So this breaks down the color and exposure of your pixels in your image. On the far left, we have the darker parts. On the far right, we have the brighter parts. And then you have the colors split into red, green, and blue. This is another way of seeing the data in your image and just helps you get those manual settings done right. You can see that as I make my image brighter, everything tends to shift over to the right-hand side. And then as I make my image darker, everything shifts over to the left. And you can also see the different lines coming on is affecting how close together those three peaks are of red green and blue because we set our white balance up for this kind of lighting it's much closer together i.e much more white when we have this light on and when we take it off blues shift across onto the right hand side being brighter because it's become a much cooler image our green is still in the middle which means our tint is still correct in the middle at the bottom we then have our phone and its record time for the settings that we're filming in and how much space is left so this is a 256 gig phone it's got 65 gigs left which is 27 percent of the space we have on the overall phone over on the far right we then have our audio settings the audio settings are something you don't really need to mess with on phone it's just going to do them automatically it's just going to get them right and that's really a separate thing to go into once you start plugging in microphones so i'm not going to cover it in this video we then have our media tab which is all the clips that you have shot here you can sign into your black magic cloud this is really powerful and you can get a whole workflow going where your proxies are automatically uploading to the cloud allowing other people to edit as you shoot i'm going to break down this workflow later on so make sure you subscribe if you want to get my process for that coming down we then have a chat if you are logged into blackmagic cloud where you can 
talk to people working on your project as you're, they're working on it. And finally, we have our settings down at the bottom. There are a few things that we want to set up here, so we'll just do that quickly now. At the very top, you have your record settings. I recommend leaving this in H.265 unless you're really keen, in which case you can choose Apple ProRes. If you do this, then you'll notice that you're limited on your frame rates. It will drop from 60 to 30, for example, in 4K as your maximum frame rate that you can actually film. But you're only going to be using ProRes if you're keen, and if you're keen, you know who you are. Then we have time code display. This is really useful if you end up with multiple cameras. Highly recommend just setting this to time of day. Then everyone else who has time of day, you'll be able to multi-cam with if you happen to pull clips off other people's phones or whatever. It's just the easiest one to leave it on, but I believe it comes default as record run, so make sure you update that. Time-lapse recording, you might as well have turned on. That's just another useful setting. And then you do want to get alerted if your media drops frame because you don't want to have footage that slows down effectively because it's missing frames or stuff stutters. Let's just leave the alert on. If you do get that alert, you want to reshoot and make sure you don't get that alert again, but it's unlikely to happen. We then have anamorphic de-squeeze, but we don't have an anamorphic lens on here, so that's not necessary. Enable vertical video you want on, just means when you twist it, it's going to then film vertical, and for most people that's what you're going to want. Lens correction you do want on, basically the lenses on the front of our phones are extremely wide, so by turning this on, it's going to try and warp the image back to a more natural look. And the rest of the settings, I believe, are on auto. If you like, you can change your shutter speed measurement over to angle, but I like to have it on speed. If it's on angle, you just always want it 180 degrees. Trigger record indicator, if you want a sound to play when you start recording or you want a light or your screen to flash, then you can set that, but I tend to just check it's recording versus needing something to blip in front of me. On your audio settings, you can leave these pretty much as default. There's not too much need to mess around with that. In monitor, we have a few different things that allow you to change personal preferences of settings. I'll let you set those up how you want. The only things you might want to play with are how opaque your guidelines are. So if you want them to just be a hundred percent solid overlay and you can't see through them then you can set it to 100 but again you can still see them at 25 and it stops the screen from being completely overwhelmingly covered in graphs so i would leave it there you can also change your focus assist color i'm colorblind so i like it to be specific colors but for most people the standard default of red is pretty good the only other thing you might want to do if you're doing a lot of filming is just turn your battery indicator on so you can see how much battery you have left as you're filming then we have our media settings. So we mentioned earlier about how you can upload proxies to your cloud as you are filming so that editors can start editing immediately, remotely. This is where you can select the settings for your proxy clips that you're uploading. And then there's a few other settings that are fairly obvious that you can go through if you want. LUTs is where you select that LUT selection for earlier when you could choose an overlay LUT, but again, don't really recommend that unless it's something you're specifically looking to do. We have our Blackmagic Cloud, which lets you log into Blackmagic Cloud. I think this is about £8 a month, but they've just changed all that. It will probably update. So if you want the cloud features, if you want to be able to integrate teams into your work and do everything live and remotely, then this is something that's really worth looking into. We have your reset settings. Don't press this after setting everything up because it's going to put it all back to default and then we have about and finally the last setting here is open black magic settings and this takes you straight through to all the permission settings that you have within black magic's app but moving forwards, it doesn't matter whether you have a mobile phone camera or a mirrorless one. You're still going to be able to use all those manual settings, get professional footage and up your production game. At the end of the day, they're both good cameras. See you soon.